Our next video comes from a senator from Florida and answers the question how a Marco Rubio presidency would provide opportunity for all and favoritism to none. You know, both of my parents were born into poor families on the island of Cuba. They came to America because it was the only place where people like them could have a chance. Here in this country, they never made it big, but the very purpose of their life was to give us the chance to do all the things they never could. My father was a bartender. And the journey from the back of that bar to this stage tonight, to me, that's the essence of the American dream. I run for president because I believe that we can't just save the American dream, we can expand it to reach more people and change more lives than ever before. My parents achieved what it came to be known as the American dream. The problem is now too many Americans are starting to doubt whether achieving that dream is still possible. Hard-working families that are living paycheck to paycheck. Young Americans, unable to start a career or a business or a family because they owe thousands of dollars in student loans for degrees that did not even lead to jobs. And small business owners who are left to struggle under the weight of more taxes, more regulation, and more government. Why is this happening? It's because while our people and our economy are pushing the boundaries of the 21st century, too many of our leaders and their ideas are stuck in the 20th century. If I'm our nominee, how is Hillary Clinton going to lecture me about living paycheck to paycheck? I was raised paycheck to paycheck. How is she going to lecture me about student loans? I owed over $100,000 just four years ago. If I'm our nominee, we will be the party of the future. We'll be the party of the 21st century, and they'll be the party of the 20th century. We will be the party of the bartenders and the maids, and they will be the party of the big companies that hire the lobbyists to influence government. That is the difference. That is our opportunity to speak to the hearts and minds and hopes and dreams of billions of Americans who want to believe and still believe that America can be greater. They just need leaders to show the way. That is our opportunity, and only our party can provide it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Senator Marco Rubio. Thanks for being here. You guys have tough questions for me? All right, good. Thank you. Senator Rubio, your first question. Oh, there's a question. lot of people here. <laughs> wow. Your first question will come from Debbie. All right. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Senator Rubio. Hillary Clinton says we need more government subsidies and control to address the growing cost of higher education. And often it seems like the right is afraid to challenge that approach. How do you propose to address this issue? Well, let's challenge it tonight, right here with you. And I'll tell you, first of all, our higher education system is completely outdated. Completely outdated. It's basically a monopoly. If you want to get a degree, you can only get a degree from a school that's traditionally accredited. What that means is these traditional colleges, and by the way, I have nothing against traditional college, otherwise, how would we have college football? So, but, go Gators, that's right. I got in trouble this week over that. I know, I know. Hey, Spurrier's a Gator, if you're from South Carolina. Anyway, but here's the problem. The problem is that who accredits these colleges? themselves. And they use the power of accreditation to keep out any competitive uh, uh, innovators that may come into the space. So here's what we need to do. Number one, some of the best paying jobs of the 21st century require more than high school, but less than four years of college. And we stopped teaching people to do this work. At some point in our country's history, we started telling our kids that being a welder or an airplane mechanic, that was for the kids who weren't smart enough to go to college. That is a lie. I'll tell you this right now because it's a fact. Here's the facts. A welder makes a lot more money than a Greek philosopher. And so the first thing we need to do is open up higher education to, to, to more vocational training. And that means people as young as 15, 16 years of age, they've decided they want to work with their hands for a living so they can actually have a job when they graduate. We should allow them to begin to receive that training so that when they graduate, they have a high school diploma and they're industry certified and ready to work. 
The second thing we need to do, the second thing we need to do is we need to provide competition to traditional higher education. So imagine for a moment a single mother. Maybe you know her, maybe it's you, so you don't even have to imagine. And you make $13 an hour as a receptionist at a law office. The only way you are ever going to get a raise is if you can go back to school to become a paralegal or a dental hygienist. But you can't go back to school because the traditional schools require you to quit your work and sit in a classroom for two to four years. But imagine if, an, if there was an alternative to that that gave you credit for what you've already learned in life, in work experience, in military experience, and then allowed you to learn the rest, whatever you're missing, from a combination of different sources, including free online coursework. That's what Mike Lee and I and others are working on, is providing an alternative accrediting model that will open up competition so people facing those circumstances can become a paralegal. And instead of making $14 an hour, they're making $60,000 a year. Here's the third thing. As I said, we're still going to have traditional four-year colleges, but we cannot continue to graduate people in this country with degrees that do not lead to jobs. I feel very passionate about that. I, I myself owed over $100,000 in student loans when I became a senator. I still owed it. I was able to pay it off with the proceeds of my book, An American Son, now available on paperback. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it really is. I'm not joking. It's available on paperback. But, Here's what I believe. Before you take out a student loan, schools should have to tell you, this is how much people make when they graduate from our school with that degree. So you can decide if it's worth borrowing $50,000 to major in Roman philosophy, because the market for Roman philosophers has dramatically tightened over the last 2,000 years. And so, in closing, what do the Democrats propose? Pouring more money into the same system pouring more of your money into the same system, as if somehow if we poured more money into it, it would work better. What I propose, what Heritage has proposed, is a new system. Revolutionize the system, modernize the system, and allow it to be about the people, not about the schools. Allow it to be about the students, not about the institutions, so that people have the skills they need to compete and succeed in the 21st century. Senator Rubio, let's stay on the theme of pouring money into a failing system. You said last month that the time for personal accounts and Social Security, quote, has passed. A recent study by the Heritage Foundation finds that an average wage-earning male who, who reaches age 65 this year will receive fewer than 92 cents for every dollar paid into that system. By 2030, it'll be down to 83 cents. Why should we be pouring more money into a failing Social Security system that gives a negative rate of return rather than truly empowering Americans with Yeah, I just think politically it's going to be very difficult to achieve that or to pass it. But I still feel we need to do something about it very strongly. Let me begin by saying this. I am from Florida. You may not know this, but there are a lot of people on Social Security and Medicare in Florida. <laughs> One of them is my mother. I am against anything that's bad for my mother, okay? But here's the fact. The fact is Social Security and Medicare are going bankrupt. In fact, the Social Security Trust Fund on Disability goes bankrupt, I believe, in about a year and a half or sooner. And then from there, it gets worse. So here's the bottom line. Anyone who tells you, I want to leave it exactly the way it is, they're in favor of bankrupting it. And anyone who tells you we don't have to make any changes is a liar. They're lying. We do. We do have, if we want to save these programs. Here's the great news. We can save Social Security and Medicare in the process, help balance our budget, and we don't have to change anything for the people like my mother that are retired now or are about to retire. But here's what it will mean. People like me, I'm 44, but after the debate on Wednesday, I feel 45. Um, <laughs> it went really long. Um, people like me, my Social Security and Medicare is going to look different than my parents. That is a fact. It either will not exist or it will look different. And what does that mean? I may have to retire a year later than my parents did. If I've been financially successful, my benefits may not grow as fast as their Social Security benefits grew. My Medicare could very well be the option of taking my Medicare money and using it to buy a private plan that I like better. These are not unreasonable changes, and if we make them, we can save these programs for future generations, help balance our budget, and not have to make any changes to the people that are on it now. If we don't, they go bankrupt, and so does our country. Senator Rubio. 
16 years after Hillary Care failed in 1994, Democrats went back and they passed Obamacare. President Bush knew that personal accounts and Social Security would be a tough fight. It was a fight that conservatives lost. Why shouldn't we go in a Marco Rubio administration and fight for personal accounts and Social Security? Well, again, I just think that I want to save these programs, and every year that goes by, it gets harder and harder to do it. And I, I believe, just reading the politics of the situation, including where many people are in our own party, we don't have time to argue this for the next 10 years. Maybe future leaders or at some point in the next few years, people will be more open to it. I personally believe that we need to deal with this issue quickly. Look, when I was elected in 2010 to the U.S. Senate, I think the debt was about 14 or 15 trillion dollars. If you had told me five years will pass and nothing will happen on the debt and nothing will happen on entitlement reform, I would have said that's impossible. At some point, someone will be reasonable about it. Well, nothing has happened. And in fact, we are weeks away from raising the debt limit once again. So there's a sense of urgency that I have about this issue. No one's talking about the debt anymore. It's like, oh, we only have a $400 billion deficit this year. It's still a deficit, and it spikes in the years to come. So I just have a sense of urgency about addressing this as quickly as possible. And I honestly believe that the way I've outlined has a bigger chance of success early on. I don't think we can afford to wait eight to 10 more years to address it, or we're gonna have a debt crisis. And if we have a debt crisis, you're not growing your economy, you won't even be able to provide for our national security. And it's not a question of when we will have a debt crisis, of if we will have a debt crisis, it is a question of when. It is the most predictable crisis in American history, it is self-inflicted, and nothing is happening about an $18 trillion debt that will be $20 trillion by the time a new president swears in. So we've got to deal with this as soon as possible, and I just think the way I've outlined gives us a better chance to do it. Senator, our next question comes from Twitter, and it's about America's position in the world. The Obama administration says it leads from behind. How do we restore American leadership in the world? Well, first of all, you'd lead, you restore American leadership by having the most powerful military in the world. And, and we are, Washington is destroying our military. And I wish I could say it was just Democrats, but it isn't. Republicans voted for that sequester deal. And here's what's sad about it. I didn't vote for it, but I'll tell you what's so sad about it. It does nothing to balance our budget. Nothing. The cause of our debt is not our military spending. And yet, yet we are eviscerating it. We are on pace to have the smallest and the oldest Navy and Air Force in the world, the smallest ar uh, in, in our history, the smallest army in, in a long time. These are serious challenges at a time when the world has gone nuts. As I said the other night, there is a lunatic, a lunatic in North Korea with dozens of nuclear weapons. The Chinese are taking over the South China Sea. The Russians are trying to divide NATO. Radical jihadists are in dozens of countries across multiple continents. Iran is also going to acquire a nuclear weapon. And we're reducing our military? And qu quantity matters. We have great aircraft carriers, but we need more of them because they can't be in two places at once. And so we must restore military spending Otherwise, we are going to fall behind and be unable to meet the threats of our time, and we won't be able to live up to our promise that we make our men and women in uniform. And that is, if we ever engage you in combat, you will be better trained and better equipped than any adversary you will ever face. We won't be able to meet that if we continue this. We, we also have to keep our promise to our veterans when they come back home. We need a VA that cares more about our veterans than about the bureaucrats that run it. And we need a foreign policy of moral clarity. What does moral clarity mean? Here's what it means. We are reliable to our allies, and our adversaries do not dare test us. I only bring that up because today we have the direct opposite. Is there a better example of it than the state of Israel? Israel is the only pro-American, free enterprise democracy in the entire Middle East. There's only one. We treat the Prime Minister of Israel with less respect under this president than we do the radical Shia cleric, the Ayatollah of Iran. That's unacceptable. Senator Rubio, you've called out, quote, big companies that have connections with Washington because they can affect policies to help themselves. Many would consider sugar subsidies, which you've supported, to be the type of favoritism that you generally reject. Can you explain your position? Yeah, on I'm that? ready to get rid of them, as long as Brazil does as well, because they're trying to destroy our agricultural system. In essence, they are deliberately undercutting the price of their agriculture, not just sugar, citrus. Why? Because if they can wipe out American farmers, 
they know that land will be developed. Once they build condos on this land, you can never get it back into agriculture. Now they control the citrus market, now they control the sugar market, then they can charge us anything they want. It's kind of what's happening with oil now with Saudi Arabia. They are overproducing so they can cut the price of oil because they know we can't export oil, so all we can do is sell to ourselves, and because of our own laws, by the way, not because the world won't buy it. And once they can knock out all of these people that, that uh, explore for oil and natural gas, especially oil, then they control the marketplace again. Agriculture is critically important. They don't just do this, but Brazil in particular does it to those two industries. I am prepared to get rid of that when it comes to trade with any country we have a free trade agreement with. And I'm prepared to pass a law right now that says when Brazil gets rid of its subsidies, we will immediately and automatically get rid of ours. But I'm not going to let Brazil destroy agriculture in America because we have to be able to feed ourselves. Many supporters of the Export Import Bank, which you oppose. I'm sorry. Sorry. Many supporters of the Export Import Bank, which you oppose, make the same argument. We'll get rid of our export subsidies when China and France and other countries do those. Why wouldn't that same argument that you just made on sugar subsidies the, apply because, on them? Yeah, because the difference is we actually have other banks that give loans. As a, you know, the, the, in essence, the Export Import Bank is not the only thing out there that gives loans. 97% of U.S. exports do not rely on the Export Import Bank. For starters, number two, there are other vehicles by which you can finance these things. There are no other alternatives when it comes to agriculture. Once you, the land is gone, you're never getting it back. When it comes to private business like this, an exporter, we have a banking industry in this country. It's, it's become too consolidated because of Dodd-Frank, and that's why Dodd-Frank needs to be repealed. But, but we have, we have non-governmental avenues for financing exports. And you really want to help exports in America? Why don't you lower regulations, reform and, and lower the tax code, repeal Obamacare, which is discouraging them from hiring people, not to mention destroying our health care system, and allow us to fully utilize our energy resources. That will do a lot more for manufacturing and export than the Export-Import Bank ever did. Senator Rubio, we're pleased to invite Governor Nikki Haley back to the stage. Hi, Governor. Welcome back to South Carolina, Senator Rubio. We're glad, glad to, to have you. All right, Marco, so this is the question. You and I both cut our teeth at the State House. Yes. And sometimes you get a lot of bruises and you get really tough skin um, when you get elected to a State House. You actually were Speaker of the House, so you had quite a big leadership role and had to push things through and herd the cats to get that done. The biggest frustration that I have and that this audience has is we were told if you hire a, a Republican majority, right. everything will change. We hired a Republican majority in both the House and the Senate. And in D.C., nothing has changed. That's what right. is going wrong? That's absolutely right. And, and that's exactly why I'm running for president, and I'll tell you why. It took me a very short amount of time to realize that our problem in Washington is that both political parties, quite frankly, are, are out of touch. The disconnect between Washington and the American people has never been bigger. Let me tell you the source of the disconnect. I'll tell you the source of the disconnect. It's not that it's evil people. Two things happen. Number one, after some time in politics, people become disconnected from the reality. They forget what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. They forget what it's like to owe thousands of dollars in student loans. They probably never did. They forget how difficult it is for someone who's starting to, trying to start a business. Do you realize that for the first time in 35 years, we have more businesses dying in America than starting? In America. And so people, that disconnect is real and it exists in both parties. And here's the other thing they lose, the sense of urgency. The urgency to, to get things done. There is no sense of urgency. The notion is that our job is just to run the process and, and just make it work better. Some people have more loyalty to the institution they serve in than the country they're supposed to be serving. And so these are the problems that we face. And it's only gotten worse over the last few years, to be quite frank. And what I realized very quickly is you will not be able to change the direction of this country unless you have a president who is in touch, has a vision for the future, and has a sense of urgency about the challenges that we face. Because here's the truth. America remains a great country. There isn't a nation on earth I would trade places with. But we are, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I've never been heckled by a dog, but that's... That's a new one for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great country. We have never trade places, but we are on the road to decline. If we continue the road that we are on today, we are going to be the first Americans ever to leave our children worse off than ourselves. That is a completely unacceptable outcome. But that's where we're going to head if we keep electing the same people, with the same ideas, we will get the same result. 
That's why the time has come to turn the page. That's why I support term limits. That's why... And that's what I was going to ask you was, do you support term limits that's in why Washington, D.C.? We have term limits in Florida, and the sky has not fallen, and no one has died yet. <laughs> term limits brings new people into the process, people that, that believe that things are possible instead of having given up already. That's why in 2009 I chose to run for the Senate, even though the entire Republican establishment in Washington lined up against me. Really, the, only one person in Washington gave me a chance, and his name was Jim DeMint, and I know he's here today, and I want to thank him. Florida, in Florida, only about five people gave me a chance, but they all lived in my home. <laughs> and four of them were under the age of 10 at the time. And that's why I chose to run for president. You know, and I'll tell you the funny thing is when Marco was running for Senate, I was running for governor, and so I was Nikki Who, but you were a little bit more known than I was. Well, we were, neither one of us was supposed to win, if but you But neither one of us was, and that's the power of the people, which I always love. We share, absolutely, that is always the power of the people. So we share something else in common, in that we are children of immigrants. How do we handle immigration reform? Well, we don't. Without, how do we handle immigration reform without dividing our country, without you know, forgetting the fact that the reason this country is so great is because the fabric of our country is from legal immigrants. How do we have that conversation and have reform? Well, it begins by acknowledging we have three immigration problems. We don't just have one, we have three. Number one, we are the most generous country in the world when it comes to immigration. A million people a year lim legally immigrate to the United States. There isn't a single country in the world that comes close to that number. And yet, despite the fact that we are so generous, there are still people coming illegally. Number two, we have a broken legal immigration system. Our legal immigration system today is built on whether or not you have a relative living here. Not whether you have a skill or a talent or you're gonna open a business. It is primarily built on whether or not you have a relative living here. And number three, you do have 11 or 12 million people in this country illegally. And almost half of them came here legally and overstayed a visa. And you have to deal with all three of them. Now I can tell you from experience, we're not gonna fix it all in one big piece of legislation for two reasons. Number one, the issue is too complex. And number two, the American people have had some terrible experiences with massive pieces of legislation. The only way forward, the only way forward is a three-step process. Step number one, before you do anything else, you must prove, not just pass a law that says you're going to do it, you must prove to the American people that illegal immigration is truly under control. And we can do that. It begins by securing the southern border through a wall and through more personnel, but you can't stop there. It's not enough. That alone will not be enough. You also need a mandatory e-verify system. And you need an entry-exit ex entry tracking system to prevent people from overstaying visas. After you've done that, the second step will be, the second step will be to modernize our legal immigration system. So that when we admit someone to this country permanently, it will be on the basis of what can they do? What can they contribute? Not what relative do they have living here? And more importantly, on the basis of whether they're coming to live in America or coming to be an American. Because we want to bring people here to be an American. You know, and what, and if we, I just want to close with it. If, if we do those two things, after those two things are done, I believe the American people are going to be very reasonable about what do you do with someone who's been here for a long time and isn't a criminal. If you're a criminal, you have to leave. But I don't think we can get to that stage until we've done the other two things. In fact, not only do I not think we can get to that stage, trust me, we cannot get to that stage until we've done the other two things. And I think that's the only way forward. Anyone who says otherwise and tells you you can do it in one massive piece of legislation, they're lying. It isn't true. Well, and I appreciate your detail on that because a lot of people like our parents, my parents, they're offended by those who don't come here legally, that don't pay the price and pay the time that they went through to get here. Well, if I could add to that, the majority, the majority of the calls I get in my Senate offices on immigration are not about people that are here illegally. It's about people that are trying to come legally and they are, and they are frustrated because they know someone who came illegally and is gonna to get to stay and they're wondering, well, why did I hire all those lawyers and wait nine years? And no one ever talks about that part of it either. So that's, that's a real frustration. We hear it in our offices all the time. 
When you hear everybody talk about securing the border, and I always say all the candidates are very quick to say secure the border, what does that look like? We need more than what a, a, a border yeah. security looks like. What does it look like in personnel? What should we expect in cost? What does it look like in equipment? No other candidate has been able to tell us exactly what securing the border looks well, like except building a wall, and we know it's more than that. We have to define what the border. The border is not just the border with Mexico. The border is also our airports and, to some extent, our seaports. And that's why an entry-exit tracking system is so critical. America has become a hotel that checks you in but never checks you out. So in essence, when you come on a visa, I know it happens all the time. People come on a visa, and it's a 90-day visa, and they check in, and we know you arrived. But we, in many places, they never log you out. So we have no idea if you're still here or not. And that's almost 40, over 40% 40 of the problem. In Florida, it's up in the 80% of the problem. So we have to change that. You need, an, you need an, a mandatory e-verify system because that job magnet has to be shut off. That's what allows people to come here. And quite frankly, that's what allows industries to take advantage of this situation. And then there are corridors on the border. When you cross the southern border, first of all, the majority of them are now coming from all over the world, primarily in the Americas, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, because those countries have become very dangerous and they're a mess. They're coming through Mexico and into the United States. That border has corridors that people come across. And the reason why they cross in those specific places is because it's near an interstate highway that takes them into a major city, Phoenix, Tucson, uh, El Paso, you name it. Those are the areas where, that we need the walls combined with personnel in the thousands of additional border agents, along with cameras and sensors. We have secured borders all over the world. Israel secured borders. Other countries have done it. We know how to do it. It takes the money and the willingness to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, a man with the details. Help me thank Senator Marco Rubio. Thank you very much.